Uh, thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's always a great pleasure to follow the member for Wakefield because he always comes up with some sort of a wacky line in his contribution, and I note that he's confused whether the member for Corio is actually a member on uh, his side. Yes, he is the Labor member for Corio, but you wouldn't know about that. And the member for Wakefield did mention the Land 400 defence contract, and I have to say I'm very pleased that he did because when it comes to fighting for jobs, I am incredibly proud of what we are doing on this side of the House. In contrast to the member for Corio, a shadow defence minister, who has absolutely shamed the people of Geelong because he has not been prepared to stand up and fight for jobs. And, uh, I draw on the member for Wakefield's contribution on this bill, and this is all about jobs, Mr Deputy Speaker, all about jobs. Order. And our bill before order the House the today— Could you take a seat and I'll hear from a point of order from the member for Wakefield, the member for Wakefield? Well, point of order, Deputy Speaker. Uh, the member for Kerangamite pulled me up on not talking about the bill, and now she's wandered off into her own uh, uh, justifications. Order. The member for Kerangamite has the call. This is wide-ranging, and I'll allow the member to continue. Thank you very much. And there's a little bit of hypocrisy there from the member for Wakefield, given he actually spoke about the Land 400 defence contract in his contribution. But I just want to put on the record that that contract uh, the Victorian government is trying to push that contract into central Melbourne by putting to the defence primes that Fisherman's Bend be the preferred location. Very disappointing. And the member for Corio has been absolutely pathetic in the way he has stood up for our city in our region and not fighting for our region to make sure that we land some of those jobs in Geelong, in Corangamite and in our wonderful region. Shame on Daniel Andrews, shame on local Labor MPs and shame on Labor's defense, shadow defence minister, the member for Corio, who has absolutely and fundamentally failed the people of Geelong. And I want to correct the record when it comes to the member for Wakefield's contribution. This is actually a decision of the Defence Primes. It is not a decision of the Department for Defence, and nor it is a decision for the Victorian government. The incentive packages, however, are very important. And what a disappointment it is that the Victorian government, in a secret plan, is trying to push all of those jobs into Fisherman's Bend and not stand up for regional Victoria, including my region. Mr. Deputy Speaker. This bill before the House today, the Building and Construction Industry Improving Productivity Amendment Bill, is a very important part of our focus on driving jobs in the building and construction sector, which employs one million Australians. Um, that is why our government last year re-established the Australian Building and Construction Commission. This is crucial to driving reform, to boosting productivity and the building code is fundamental to uh, our objective to make sure that we can start seeing a, a construction sector, Mr Deputy, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, which is thriving, and we have not seen that under the previous Labor government. Uh, this bill amends the expiry of the, the transitional grace period from the 28th of November 2018 to the 31st of August 2017 for enterprise agreements made before the building code commenced on the 2nd of December 2016. So while new enterprise agreements made after the 2nd of December 2016 must comply with the code, building industry participants covered by existing enterprise agreements uh, we'll now have until the 31st of August 2017 to ensure their agreements are code compliant. Now, this is a very reasonable period of time. Building companies have been on notice for a very significant period of time that uh, they had the particular notice to. Um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I would ask that members opposite stop Order. interjecting. Um, the, the members the are member being quite rude board. and, frankly, it is absolutely inappropriate. So, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, the bill also limits the exemption to building industry participants submitting expressions of interest and tendering for Commonwealth-funded building work. This means 
enterprise agreements will need to comply with the building code before contracts are awarded and work gets underway. So uh, we are very proud to be putting this bill before the House because what this amendment does, Mr Deputy Speaker, is create a level playing field for those in the industry. There are some building companies who didn't enter into a new enterprise agreement because they knew that they were obliged to incorporate into the enterprise agreement the building code. Now, I include in those companies Kane Constructions, which is doing wonderful work in the city of Geelong in a $74 million construction of, of stage four of Simmons Stadium. There are other companies that rushed their agreements through and thought that they would have two years to move to um, the building code, which frankly was far too long. And I do want to commend Senator Hinch, because initially, of course, he opposed this particular component of the ABCC legislation. And over the summer, and I spoke to Senator Hinch today, and I congratulated him, and he said, you know, Sarah, in politics, when you make the wrong call, when you make the wrong decision, you have to be man enough or woman enough to change your mind and to set things right. And that's exactly what Senator Hinch has done in putting to the Prime Minister that two years is too long. Now, the reason, as we all knew on this side of the House, the reason Senator Hinch took that approach was because over the summer he was approached by many building companies which said to him, uh, this is absolutely unfair. You are forcing us to comply with the code, and yet other companies have two years to move to a building code. That creates a very unlevel playing field and puts us at an enormous disadvantage. It hurts us. We won't be able to tender for the same work because we have much higher obligations. And in the end, Senator Hinch recognised that this was going to hurt companies and it was going to hurt workers. It was going to hurt workers. And that's why Senator Hinch, after speaking to many, many people, uh, recognised the inequity of Labor's position and put to the Prime Minister that a nine-month transition period is appropriate. So building companies now have a reasonable period of time to renegotiate their, their enterprise agreements so that all companies are on a level playing field. Now, the member for O'Connor in his contribution earlier in the day said, look, I don't know what this is going to do to improve productivity. How is this going to fix business? What's the problem with, uh, with an enterprise agreement including a broad scope of terms? Well, clearly the member for O'Connor is a member for uh, Gorton or a member for O'Connor? Sorry? Member for Gorton. I'm sorry, I apologise. The member for Gorton. The member for Gorton hasn't done his homework. The member for Gorton hasn't done his homework because enterprise agreements in the building and construction industry have included a broad range of restrictive work practices, discriminatory provisions, uh, and provisions which hurt building companies and which hurt workers. Some examples are there have been enterprise agreements which have required contractors to employ a non-working shop steward or job delegate. A non-working shop steward. There have been clauses where there is a one-in, all-in clause, where if one person is offered overtime, all other workers must be offered overtime whether or not there is enough work. So let's just pay workers for work that they don't do. That was a requirement in some enterprise agreements. Some enterprise agreements include jump-up provisions which prevent engaging subcontractors unless they provide certain union-dictated terms and conditions to workers despite their existing lawful industrial arrangements. So, in other words, some enterprise agreements make it impossible for building companies to lawfully engage some contractors because they are so restrictive. Uh, there is also provisions which require contractors to obtain the approval of a union over the number and types of employees that a contractor may engage on a project.